about real people, real stories, real life. And here are our hosts for the third chair, Peter Grigg and Doug Bezeski, and our returning guest, Joni Shepard. Welcome back to the third chair with our special guest, Joni Shepard. Thank you for being here, Joni. Thank you. Well, as um, as uh, the the viewers know, tonight's um, episode is going to be somewhat intense as you share some of your story. And uh, you've given me um, permission to ask some questions that a lot of people may not feel very comfortable answering. And thank you for that. Um, just a uh, uh, want our uh, viewers to be aware that this um, may not be child appropriate um, material for them to watch at this time. So we've been talking about uh, the your nonprofit Hope and Grace International and how so much of that um, was founded uh, under the uh, impetus of trying to help the church um, address the issue of abortion. And particularly the long-term consequences to men and women that were involved in the process. And uh, clearly you're passionate about it, which makes people perhaps think um, there's, um, there's a story to it. And uh, please uh, share what you're willing to share about that personal story that was clearly a part of that. Certainly. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share it. Um, as you may have heard in the first episode, I was raised as a missionary kid and it was a very conservative home and um, right and wrong were very clear to me. However, um, when I graduated from high school, I there was a, a guy that kind of tried to follow me from country to country. Wow. I met him in Australia when I was still 17 and or just barely 17. And um, he was a college graduate. And um, after we left Papua New Guinea, we took a little vacation in New Zealand on our way back to the States. And he heard I was going to be there. So he got a job over there to oh. see me mm. and of course my parents didn't want me going out with him for obvious reasons um because of the age difference and they didn't know him but i i pulled the drama queen act and i you know have i ever done anything that you can't trust me and mm. I mean, I was just, I was sobbing and, mm. you know, I just, we just want to go shopping and go sightseeing. That's all. Mm -hmm. And I, I finally talked them into letting me go. And um, so I had a really nice day with this guy. I saw all kinds of sights. And when it was getting late afternoon, he said, uh, I want to stop by my apartment to pick something up before I take you back. And I'm like, okay, fine. And it was there that we didn't have the term back then, but he date raped me. And it was just such a shocking thing. I found myself like oh, my parents were right, and I can't tell them, you know. I, I, So I kept that a secret for decades. Um, but I think that that really affected me um, emotionally and mentally, you know, subconsciously. And um, I became sexually active when we got back to the States and, you know, not really bad, but just I had a boyfriend and then I had another boyfriend and suddenly I find myself pregnant and I was just barely 18 mm -hmm. and I was terrified. So the first 
Can't my, imagine. Yeah, the, I did a pregnancy test at home to confirm it. And I thought, well, I've got to go to my church. They'll help me figure this out. And so I did, and they set me up with a counselor. And she spent about 45 minutes with me telling me how wrong and guilty I was and how I needed to change my lifestyle. And it was like, for me, it was like, duh, I know that. I don't need to be told that. I came for help, but, you know, I was still pretty scared and what do you say the only thing that was said about solutions to my problem was you can't have an abortion because that's murder well i left there no better off actually worse off than when i entered and i determined wow i will not tell another christian what i'm going through because you know, who needs that? And so, but I still didn't want an abortion. That was not any, my, my intent at all. Um, I looked through the phone book that was back when we used paper phone books. And, <laughs> dark ages. <laughs> right, the dark ages. And um, I avoided abortion clinics, but I found Planned Parenthood. And I, I thought in my mind, oh, they'll help me plan to be a parent. I'll get my help there. What a nice title. Yes. <laughs> it was, um, you know, it seemed very appropriate. It wasn't about abortion. Um, so I go there and they had a counselor that I would say in quotes. Um, she she's really only spent maybe five or ten minutes with me. Um, telling me, oh, I can tell this is not a good time for you to be pregnant. And right now it's just, you know, it's just a piece of tissue anyway. Um, we can, we can take care of that with an abortion. And so here I was, you know, I'd gone to the church and had felt very shamed for sharing, you know, this horrible situation in my life and then I go to Planned Parenthood and they're very welcoming and very kind and they had a solution and after the response I got from the church I was like I'm not even going to tell my parents and this counselor told me because I asked her I said well you know what do I tell my family and she said just tell them you had a cyst removed because it's the same surgery to have a cyst removed so she even told me how to lie to them and i did and um they scheduled the appointment my boyfriend drove me there i sat in a room with about seems like 20 to 30 other women we were all in in our surgical gowns and caps and slippers and i remember sitting there thinking you know we're because they you know call us one at a time and it was like we're just like cattle waiting for slaughter that went through my mind mm -hmm. um but i didn't know anything about prenatal development and i didn't know anything about abortion nobody explained any of that to me and so i I was put to sleep for the procedure. I woke up vomiting and crying, and I knew in my heart I'd done the worst thing that anybody could do. But I went immediately into denial. Mm. Like, okay, I've just I've just gotta go back to my life and you know, get through life and do what I do. And pretend everything's good. And so I'm certain that I went to church on Sunday. I had my abortion. I don't remember what day of the week it was. And then I went to church the next Sunday and, you know, smile on my face. Everything's fine. And I didn't, I didn't really know what happened. I didn't know what happened to my baby. I mean, I don't think the word baby was really ever mentioned. So, but I did know I'd done the worst thing anybody could do. And when you feel like that, it doesn't matter what you do now. 
Okay. I'm gonna. We're gonna uh, 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 stop right there. I want you to hold that thought. Okay. We're gonna take a brief break. When you come back, let's pick up uh, right there. Okay. We'll be right back. Hi, it's Peter from the set of the Third Chair. I just want to put in a good word for my uh, good friend and owner of Nine Round Kickboxing in Colorado Springs, uh, Melissa Lance. Uh, her studios provide a phenomenal workout in 30 minutes. I know I've benefited from it over the last two years. I've lost over 30 pounds and really appreciate the encouragement, the excitement, the expertise of the trainers. It's a great workout. I encourage you to check it out. That's nine round kickboxing in Colorado Springs. <laughs> Welcome back to the third chair with our special guest, Joni Shepard. Thanks for being here, Joni. Um, we just would like to uh, mention to our viewers that we're talking about some very intense uh, issues tonight that may not be uh, totally uh, young child appropriate, so please uh, be aware. Uh, Joni, where we left off, um, you had shared about some uh, very personal things, including the fact that you had uh, an abortion when you were 18, and that uh, afterwards, um, say around uh, within a week of the time, you were then trying to get back to life as normal. Mm -hmm. But you found that that was not necessarily the case. Uh, tell us your story from that point on. Well, from that point on, um, having already done the worst thing anybody can do, in my mind, um, I just became more promiscuous. And I found myself pregnant again. And this time I realized I was 19. I realized I'm just going to skip the church this time. Who needs that? Right. <laughs> and I mean, I still, I hadn't given up on the church. I hadn't given up on God. I just, it was like I was leading a totally double life. Mm. And nine months after my first abortion, I had a second abortion. Mm. And at that point in my life, I was a worship leader for our singles group at the church that I went to. And I led worship on a Sunday morning. The next Saturday, I had an abortion. And the next day, I Sunday, I went back and led worship again with a smile on my face. And I didn't realize still the damage I was doing, I was sort of like a zombie just doing what I felt like I had to do because I didn't feel like I had any support for any other choice. And so I found myself just, like I said before, I just gotta, just gotta do life and keep the smile on my face and do wear, everything wear else the right. Mask. Wear the mask. Did you feel isolated and abandoned in a sense? Um, 
I probably did, but I think those feelings were so buried that I, I didn't, I couldn't acknowledge them. And, um, it wasn't until I got married and I married actually the father of my second baby that I had aborted. Only when I had that abortion, I didn't even tell him about it. I, I waited until after the abortion and I told him I was pregnant and I miscarried. And so I, I just, you know, I had these lies going on and I, I had, I had told my then husband about my first abortion, but not about the second. I told my parents about the second, but not about the first. So I had to keep my story straight. It was very you know, scary, you know, I didn't want to slip and say the wrong thing to the wrong person. And so, um, I got pregnant on purpose because now I'm married. So that should make me a respectable person, which in reality it didn't because I was still just as broken, but it, it was when I was pregnant and studying prenatal development for the first time and I realized, oh my Lord, my babies, they were not pieces of tissue. They had fingers and toes and beating hearts. Mm -hmm. And I was just devastated. And then about around that time while I was still pregnant, I had gotten a pamphlet from an organization called Children, Things We Throw Away. And then there was another wow. pamphlet. and that this other pamphlet showed, it talked about the different types of abortion procedures and it had pictures. And I was just completely devastated. But you know, if you can't go to your church about your pregnancy, you certainly can't go to your church about your abortion. So I was just trapped. I wanted to kill myself. I was so devastated and blown away by what I'd done. When you say you wanted to kill yourself, you mean that literally like you had suicidal thoughts? And... Literally, yes, I did. But I knew that if I killed myself, I'd be killing yet another baby. And so I was truly trapped. Mm -hmm. And so I just went through that pregnancy doing the best I could, had the most beautiful baby boy born to me and nice. yeah I could not have been given a more precious gift from God mm -hmm. after the children I'd thrown away and this you know you would think okay everything's healing I'm doing better but no that's when the nightmares started and every night I would have gruesome nightmares about losing my son every night at, when I would and I developed insomnia because it wasn't pleasant going to sleep because it was and then I would also I would hear him crying so I would go and check on him in the night and he wasn't crying and so I'd go back to bed and it happened again and it happened again. Of course, sometimes he was crying because that's what babies do. They need to be fed or changed in the night. But I heard crying when he wasn't crying. So I learned later that's audible hallucinations. Mm. And so I was just so disconnected. And, and what do you do with that? You know, I still can't go to my church about it. And I, I didn't even know how to connect it all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I learned about a pregnancy center um, in Dallas, Texas, I lived in a suburb and I thought I need to, I need to go there. I need to volunteer. I need to make sure that no, you know, other people don't do this, mm. make the mistakes that I did. And so I went through their training. I, I learned a lot and then I was able to counsel with women, you know, and tell them my story a little bit. And it was just, it was so amazing when they chose life mm -hmm. for their babies. 
I still had a long way to go in my healing because there was just so much I didn't understand. And it was while I was volunteering at the pregnancy center that I came across a Bible study for um, women who had had abortions to help them heal. And it was called Women from Rama. And from Rama? From Rama. Yeah, What's the Rama It's a biblical um, reference to, um, and I can't remember the exact phrasing of the verse, but <clears throat> the women from Rama weeping for their children, having to do with, I believe, when uh, one of the episodes in history when Herod killed all the, all he killed the, all the, yeah, the, all the, the up to two year olds. Yeah, when he was trying when, to kill when he was trying Jesus. Trying to kill, yeah, Christ, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, okay. Right. And yeah, so yeah. Um, I, I knew because of growing up with a psychologist's dad, oh, and yes. it was a really stable, happy home, I knew there was this huge difference between the before abortion Joni and the after abortion Joni. I knew I was messed up. And at that point, my shame didn't matter. I needed help. And I knew I couldn't be the only person in my church who's been through this. And so I asked my pastor, I told my pastor, I, I spilled my guts to him. I said, look, I've, I've been through this twice. And would you let me share my story and invite other women to do this Bible study with me? And thinking back now, I'm like, who does that? You know, because like there's so much shame and so much stigma surrounding abortion. And yet I knew what healthy looked like and I wasn't healthy. And so yeah. I needed to get there. I'm going to stop you in that. We're going to go to a break. But when we come back, uh, I mean... Um, I think the whole talking about the whole idea of getting healthy and forgiven and recovering. I mean, your story sounds like what people with drug addiction kind of go through as well. Mm -hmm. The brokenness and, and right. being re put together. You know, let's um let's uh pick that up on the things that you did or have seen other women do to deal with this trauma and also to throw in there i know men that are involved with this decision can be heard as well okay, exactly. what you've noticed um has been helpful for them uh, okay. when we come back sounds good we'll get back to our guest in just a moment but do you have a story to tell would you yes you like to be a guest on the third chair send us an email and tell us about yourself and your story. And please follow us on social media. Now back to the episode. <laughs> Welcome back to the third chair with our special guest, Joni Shepherd. Uh, tonight's uh, content is intense, and so it may not be uh, appropriate for all children. Joni, uh, you've shared some really personal and intense details of your life, including the fact that you had two abortions and the horrible psychological and traumatic aftermath of that. Mm -hmm. um, I know there are a lot of people watching that have experienced the same thing, and it begs the question, how did you get better? How did you get well? What had to happen for that journey even to be able to get to a place then where you could even help other people? Right. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, one of the main issues that I had was anger. And it was all directed at myself. Because I, having been raised a missionary kid, um, I should have known better. Mm -hmm. And I, I messed my life up. I couldn't blame anybody else but myself. And I, I hated myself. I, I raged. And my, my precious little boy, he witnessed his mom just being angry a lot and sometimes mm -hmm. at him. And so, um, but I didn't know why I was angry. I was never angry like that before abortion, only after. And so 
um, that was part of the reason I knew I was just, I, I couldn't, I didn't know how to change or control that. And so when I did that Bible study or I shared at church about the Bible study and I shared my story, there were six women that came to me afterwards and five of them ended up joining that Bible study and another one and others joined later to at another Bible study. But the fantastic thing about this study, which um, is just really amazing, and it's not something that we talk about in regards to abortion very much, is that it takes the woman through the grieving process. Mm. Most women, when they have an abortion, go immediately into denial, just like I did. And many times that can last for decades until something triggers them out of it. Um, you know, for me, it was that pamphlet that I had and, and learning about prenatal development and um, being triggered from a trauma because abortion is trauma. It's, it's, it's a terrible trauma and it's mm -hmm. a, a shameful trauma and most people, especially Christians, can't talk about it. So um, there's so many aspects of healing, but you can't get to the healing until you recognize you're messed up. You know, as long as you're, I'm good. I'm good, you know, because mm -hmm. that's what we do. We tell ourselves are good. We're good while we're um, speaking abusively to our children, you know, or mm -hmm. whatever else we do. Um, and so I had to admit I was messed up, and I needed to seek God's forgiveness. I needed to understand my sin, and instead of beating myself up, recognize that Jesus died to cover even my sin, even my abortions. That was enough. One subject that comes up often with abortion is women saying, I can't forgive myself. Just can't forgive myself. I can accept God's forgiveness, but I can't forgive myself. And I've I've pondered that so many times over the years because I used to say that myself. I can't forgive myself. And that's why I was beating myself up. But I finally came to the realization that I was saying to Jesus, what you did wasn't enough for me. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't about forgiving myself. It was about accepting that he, he paid the price with his own life for my sin. And... That was it's so freeing because I don't think I could ever actually forgive myself for taking the lives of my two children. But I am seen in God's eyes as holy and blameless because of what Jesus, the sacrifice that he made for, for my life. You know, it sounds to me like there's an element in this of... Um, when you can actually talk to somebody else about what's happened, that that's also the start of the forgiveness process too. Mm -hmm. You know, there there's a saying that like shame grows in the dark mm -hmm. and that when it's sort of put out there and began to talk about, that's when really the, the amazing healing can begin to occur. Exactly. That, you know, open yeah. discussion. And it has to be with the right people, obviously. Right. And there can be a very, a, a lot. So you mentioned grieving. And, and so I, I'm picking up a couple of different things you're saying here. I'm not putting words in your mouth. Just tell me if uh, I'm off base. One is the whole idea of, of feeling like you're forgiven by God, which mm -hmm. is important. But a grieving process is also about... Okay, acknowledging I had something and I've lost it and I'm grieving over the fact that that's gone too, right. which is different than the, the forgiveness exactly. part. It's a, a whole right. different um, <clears throat> um, 
process. Exactly. Am, am I hearing you right? You are hearing me right. And and grief, just like when we lose a family member or a close family friend or, you know, you don't grieve and then you're over it mm -hmm. and you never miss that person again. Right. Grief lasts forever. I mean, you know, the grieving process. And it doesn't mean that you are weeping all the time, but there's always going to be that loss. The important thing is that you go through all of those steps of grieving. The first, which is denial, like, you know, nothing really bad happened. I, you know, I'm good. Everything's mm -hmm. fine. Um, and then recognizing um, the depression, you know, that, that you feel in many women and men who have lost children to abortion also, just uh, the changes that happen in their ability to bond with one another. Like for instance, I, I couldn't bond with my son because how can you bond with somebody you lose every night in mm -hmm. your nightmares? And so I went through all the motions of being a good mom and people that, friends that saw me thought I was a great mom and for all intents and purposes, other than my anger, I was. But um, I, I just, I didn't, I didn't know what to do with those emotions because they were they were part of the grieving process that I had halted by saying I'm okay and trying to convince myself of that, and so. Anger is a huge part of mm -hmm. the grieving process, mm -hmm. you know, and, and learning that I wasn't the only one responsible in my situation. I can't blame anybody else. I can't hold it against them, but they played roles in it. The church played a role by never talking about it other yeah. than about killing the babies. The counselor played a role and, and so um, I had to, you know, recognize, okay, I'm not the only one here who made mistakes, um, but I, I had to, you know, I had to work through that depression and that anger and, and work through the, the, um, the loss. I lost two children. I didn't just have two medical procedures. I lost two children. People don't act like, um, you know, people don't go through the grieving process, um, not on any level similar to this, when they have their gallbladder removed. Nor do they go through uh, that. If, um, if they had a two-year-old child, that died, there would be a funeral and exactly. formal grief, and that didn't occur. Exactly. All right, so we're going to hold that thought right okay. there, and I want you to unpack that a little bit okay. as we also move towards uh, what are the things you did to get well and um, suggestions for other women that have had an abortion and are suffering. Okay, thank when you. When we come right back. All right. Quantum Leap Recovery is the podcast of Pikes Peak Recovery Coaching. The podcast is researched, narrated, and facilitated by me, Dr. Peter Gray, a licensed physician in long-term recovery and recovery coach. I will interview guests, but also bring to your attention the latest medical findings and advances. I want to connect with others and get input from the listeners. Insights and topic requests will be shared and acted upon. So why the name Quantum Leap Recovery? What's a quantum leap? Well, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines it as an abrupt change, sudden increase, or dramatic advance. For example, the experimental medication proved to be a quantum leap forward in treating cancer. Recovery can occur as regular baby steps and or at times by quantum leaps. We are going to talk about the many roads, pathways, and timetables to recovery. A personal quantum leap 
sometimes occurs when we find an unfamiliar approach to our problem. So join us on our podcast and support us on Red Circle. Welcome back to the third chair. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The not, missed, the, the not the fourth chair. Yes, <laughs> we're with our special guest Jody Shepard, and thank you for um, continuing to join us. We're talking about some pretty intense stuff here that may not be uh, entirely child appropriate, so please keep that in mind. Joni has uh, shared uh, some very uh, personal information about having two abortions and the aftermath of that. And I'd like us to focus over the next few moments about what you did to overcome some of those uh, struggles and uh, perhaps uh, some suggestions for some other women that we know are suffering silently um, that are not sure what to do or where to go with these issues. All right, very, very good thoughts um, because silence is, is deadly. It's without us talking about it, we can't heal. Um, I said in James, James 5, 17, it says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's key to healing. Um, and so doing that Bible study, which that Bible study is still around, only now it's called Forgiven and Set Free mm. um, by Linda Cochran. And um, there's a lot of other studies out there also. I love that one because I have gotten so much healing from it and I've, I've led it many times. I don't even know how many times over the years. And every time, I go through it again, leading it, I get more healing, I get more understanding, I get more perspective. Um, I never recommend anybody doing that Bible study on their own mm. because then they miss out on the perspective of others. And there's so much I've learned from other women over the years. And every time I do that study, I gain more healing. Um, there's other things that I've, that I've encountered that have, um, you know, brought the grief back to me, but also was healing at the same time. Um, like there was the movie October Baby that came out, um, I think in 2012. Um, that told the story. Um, it's actually based greatly on the story of Claire Colwell, who is, she found out when she was, I think, 19 or so, that she, um, she knew she was adopted. Her parents had adopted her, but she went in search of her birth mother. And in the course of that, she found out that she um, had been an attempted abortion. Wow. And, and she survived it. And she survived it. Her twin brother did not survive it. And so watching that movie, just in the beginning credits of the movie, I was just sobbing. And John was next to me. I was just like, I couldn't believe how hard that hit me. And my abortions were both in 1980, and this was 2012. And here I was just like, a mess from it. We went home and we debriefed together, my husband and I, for about three hours, just how that affected me. And then another movie that I never recommend somebody who's been through an abortion, who's lost children to abortion, to watch it alone is, but it's an, a fantastic movie and it gives so much understanding to um, the abortionist's view of abortion and, and a lot of other aspects, but the movie Unplanned that came out, I think it was a couple years ago, um, about Abby Johnson, who was a director of a Planned Parenthood, and um, finally one day she 
was watching an ultrasound of an abortion happening and it it just devastated her and she had already had abortions herself and um a big time trigger it, yeah big time trigger and so i watched that once with a friend we held hands most of the time and cried through it i watched it again with my husband i cried through it it wasn't you know it's just it just brings up the reality of, of what you've done. If I hadn't been through the healing that I've been through, I would have been much more devastated and, wow. and without hope. And that brings us back to, you know, Hope and Grace International. Part of the Bible study was we were encouraged to name our children mm. because yes. they were, they are real living human beings they're just in a different location now they're in heaven and i named my first baby hope because i finally had hope mm -hmm. that i didn't have to kill myself i didn't have to be devastated the rest of my life and then i named my second baby grace because there is no hope without the grace of God, uh -huh. because that is eternal hope. I mean, we can hope for, you know, things to go well here on earth, but that's not eternal hope. And I had eternal hope that I would see my children again. And so that's when I named my organization, it was just like oh, Hope and Grace International. Uh you know, I, a question, it's a little bit of a sub point, but I think it's important. Part of what I also hear you saying, you mentioned, you know, uh, going through uh, the Bible studies together, watching the movie, you know, mm -hmm. being with your husband. This doesn't sound like a journey someone can successfully take alone. Definitely. Um, no. And I don't mean to put words in no, your No, I totally agree because um, if, if it's as long as it's a secret, Satan can beat you over the head with it and you're all alone in it. You, you struggle with guilt. You struggle with anger like I did and all kinds of emotions and all kinds of, you know, broken relationships. Um, I was finally able to bond with my son after I'd gone through the Bible study. Oh, wow. That's instance. awesome. Um, because I couldn't, I, I loved him, but I I just I couldn't bond with him. I know he bonded with me because I went through all the motions and did the, a lot of the right things. Um, but I realized, and this was a very important moment in my relationship with my son, when he was about three and a half and he was playing on the floor one day and I had gone through the Bible study and I was just so convicted over my anger and what he witnessed. And so I, I said, I got down on the floor with him and I said, Micah, mommy's been really angry a lot and sometimes at you and I need to ask your forgiveness. I said, I, it's never your fault when I'm angry at you and I just can you forgive me and Micah who was born with a heart of gold he stood up and put his arms out and around mm. me and said I forgive you mommy and so I believe that was a pivotal moment not only in my life but in his because at that moment of forgiveness I think he forgot I think he truly, he doesn't remember me being an angry mother. Awesome. And I believe that was healing. Mm. And so it just that gives you an idea of how abortion affects other people. Mm -hmm. the, the trickle effect um, or the tsunami sometimes. Um, mm. it's, it's so, and the secret, it's got to be a secret. And because... The church isn't talking about it for the most part, or when they talk about it, it's in terms of the babies that die, which just... Or the mom, the murderer. Or the mom, the murderer, yeah, right, which yeah. just sends 
people like me, especially who haven't been healed, it sends us under our pews. It sends us into hiding. We don't, you know, we don't know what to do with that when mm -hmm. we haven't been through healing. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've often wondered, why am I doing so well? Whereas other people who've had abortions and even they've been through healing, they've gone through a Bible study and they've gone through all this healing, but they can't talk about it at their church still. So it's still a secret. Mm -hmm. There's a few people that, you know, they may never see again in their life. Who they've gone through this Bible study together, but the people they live with don't know. And mm -hmm. so Satan can, you know, don't, sure. shh, you don't tell because if you tell, everything's gonna be turned upside down, and people aren't gonna like you, and you're, you know, you're gonna be shamed all the more. And that's what I call Satan's dirty secret because he knows that the moment you do confess, especially in a safe place, then you, that's when your healing truly begins and your freedom begins because Satan can't beat you up if it's not a secret like he did before. We're going to have to end on that thought. Uh, we'll uh, wrap up the show when we come right back. Welcome back to the third chair and uh, thank you Joni for all that information and we're going to put on the screen contact info for those who are going through abortion or thinking of abortion or had an abortion and want somebody to talk to so they, they can get help because I think it's very important that as you said and pointed out so well in this show that um, when you get help and that's when you start to heal and, right. uh, and I think there's a lot of people out there who need healing yes. so thank you for that mm. and uh, since we can end on a light note <laughs> I was told your favorite movie is what about Bob <laughs> yes okay well, my favorite what? comedy <laughs> oh your favorite comedy yes. so, so, so what's so great about this movie well Bob Bob is a um, he has multiple um, serious mental health diagnoses and he um, goes to a psychiatrist, I believe, and um, he ends up driving his psychiatrist insane while at the same time he gets healed while he's hanging out with um, the psychiatrist's family against the psychiatrist's will. So, um, so the psychiatrist is kind of doing his job all the wrong way. Right. <laughs> yeah. He, he wants to keep his practice separate from his family and he's on vacation with his family and Bob is very manipulative and finds out where he is and goes and, and he gets healed from all of his, 
all of his quirks, you know, that he's suffered with that no psychiatrist has been able to help him with by hanging out with a psychiatrist family who's very down to earth and they love Bob. And the psychiatrist is like, I don't want anything, you know, don't invite him here, don't, you know, whatever. But I, what I love about the movie is that he, he gets better in community. He gets better with loving people around him. Oh, good, yeah. And so while it's a hilarious movie, it's like that is true for all of us. Deep right. lesson there. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Right. So, so watch What About Bob? Don't watch Jonathan Livingston see. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to do a What About Bob summary. We'll do a, a 30 second movie that summarizes that. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Future episode. <laughs> right. Yeah, his psychiatrist even tries his final, his final attempt at, you know, just getting rid of Bob is he tries to blow him up. Wow, he, he's he attaches, really yeah, he attaches explosives, explosives to him, and Bob um, is like, "Oh, I get it. My, you know, my illness is killing me. You know, and I need to get out of these restraints." And so he frees himself, and and then he blows up his doctor's house. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, yeah. probably a sizable segment of uh, society oh the, hey there's an alliteration that um, would uh, have similar feelings yes <laughs> <laughs> well Joni thank you so much for joining us today and sharing um, your very personal life we know it'll help a lot of people and we're so um, appreciative uh, do let us know when you've got your next book uh, completed. We'd like to know more about that. Right. And um, we'll see everyone next week. Don't forget to like, subscribe, ring the bell, and uh, share this podcast with your friends. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Next week, our guest will be Ralph Giordano. Want to be a guest? Want to sponsor our show? Send us an email. Please subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.